So good afternoon. Um, welcome to the, um, uh, the second of our webinars we're doing about the National Satellite Test Facility. My name is uh, Matt Fletcher. I'm the Environmental Test Division Head um, here in um, Rillerford Appleton Laboratory. And I'm going to do a bit of a talk and an overview and then I'm going to hand over to Giles Case. The one we did in January of 22. If you did, then welcome back. If you didn't and you want to see it, you can find it by searching National Satellite Test Facility in the video function. And it's on YouTube and it's titled NSTF Webinar. And that's the image that appears when you do your, the, the search. The one today is going to be focused very much about the infrastructure it's critical to the facility and Giles Case will be doing the majority of the talking as we go. Uh, and then future ones will cover the other topics, the dynamics, the electromagnetics and the thermal vacuum as we get more um, information as the equipment is um, site, acceptance site acceptance tested and we go through our characterization period. So. Just as a top level overview for the facility. So this is an integrated facility for the environmental testing of satellites up to seven tons. There's no minimum limit, but obviously putting a very small satellite in this facility wouldn't seem right. Um, it's all operated in clean conditions and ISO 8 and 6, and Giles will go through a whole bunch of detail about that in his next talk. And we're performing testing in thermal vacuum, vibration, acoustic, electromagnetic, and mass property testing. And this is all operated as a dedicated test center. So I know I've shown this slides before, but just to go through again, this is where we're located in the UK. There's a picture of the aerial of the site and the yellow circle is the National Satellite Test Facility building, which is essentially finished from the outside. And you can see on the backdrop behind some images of the inside. But these are not the only facilities we have that are operated through my division. And the image that's just appeared at the bottom of the screen is just the example of the thermal vacuum chambers we have. So the largest, the one on the right, is the um, large space, the satellite test facility, uh, large space test chamber, sorry, um, that we have for the National Satellite Test Facility. The two next ones, next smallest are five meter chambers, which we have in our building in this facility and the smaller scale facilities coming over into an old building over there. And they've been operated for many decades. So we're not coming without heritage in the operations of test facilities. I think it's useful to just see a little bit about progress on site. And what you're looking at here is a video, which is a, a, obviously a time-lapse video of the almost the final set of shrouds being installed into the large uh, space test chamber. So this is an eight meter diameter chamber, 15 meters long, um, that goes from 90 Kelvin to 400 Kelvin, cooled with liquid nitrogen and or um, heated with heating elements. And you can see um, the supplier is there installing the shrouds. And this is the probably the best piece of visible progress we've got since the last webinar. Um, you can see in the very foreground, actually, the door shroud, which will fit behind the door. And in fact, already is now fitted behind the door. So some great progress on the facilities so far. Um, they're really coming on but they're clearly not yet in an operational state. As you can see, people are still in the construction phase. In terms of the timeline, um, I've shown this before. Um, things are, have changed a week or so, um, plus or minus. So essentially this year sees the, the project being built. So that's at the end of that, the building is handed over. We're transitioning to the operational state, well, from last month all the way to uh, next summer. The EMC and the antenna measurement system is still under supplier control till November. Uh, vibration is coming into uh, June, thermal vacuum into October, mechanical ground support equipment 
into the summer and the same with the mass properties. And then my team take on um, the task of actually really understanding and characterizing this equipment and making sure it's ready for customers to use. So at the end of the characterization period is when we're going to be ready for customers to come into the facility and we're ready to perform testing for them. So during that characterization period, we've got some overarching goals that we're trying to do. First of all, make sure that we can operate safely and it's appropriate that we really have um, characterized all the performance, that the ECSS standard is supported, that we're um, talking to uh, ESA about uh, uh, achieving, and that the operational team have been trained and we've proved their competence. So we're going to be doing that by the use of some representative items. So we've bought some and we've borrowed some. That we are going to be really ensuring the technical performance is really well known. So we're taking it to the limits of what it can do. We're going to be testing every credible accident scenario, failure modes, power removal, etc. Data recovery is checked under any credible scenario and we've checked all the data capacity. Alongside the equipment, and what we do in the characterization, people are incredibly important. So we have an organogram, which has been remarkably stable. And we've been recruiting for the last few years and the dotted line shows where we are. So when we're in full operations, not just for National Satellite Test Facility, but all the facilities that my division operate will be about 45. And currently we're at 36. So we've got a little more to go, but that's fine because we've got time to get there. So really good progress on people. If you want to access the facilities, our primary contact is through the business development team, Dr. Sarah Nash, and you'll be hearing um, from her a little bit anyway. We're really happy to discuss requirements at any stage. Um, give us your RFI and we'll um, an RFQ, and we'll be happy to provide you a quotation. So that's it from me. So I think I'd like to... Um, so thank you and hand over to Giles Case. Hello, everybody. Um, yeah, I'm Giles Case. Um, I work for Matt Fletcher. Um, I'm looking after the underpinning infrastructure of the building and have been part of um, the design team for both our existing facilities and new NSCF facilities. So um, what I'd like to talk about is the building. So you got a hint of this building from the aerial shot that Matt shared earlier. Uh, this is um, a little bit closer, um, but it's not easy for me to really describe what's going on in the building looking like this. So here's the CAD representation of it. Um, it was all built in CAD, so we can um, understand it fully from that. Um, so let's take away the background, which is a little distracting. And this is the elements I'm responsible for and we'll be talking about. So it's actually a really complex building as far as the mechanical and electrical services go. Um, modern buildings are as a rule, but this one even more so because it has a lot of technical um, facilities which need services. So let's look at it a little bit more in detail. Uh, so this is a cut through of the building. Um, this shows you our incoming airlock. So this is where you bring your equipment in, um, unload it from your vehicle or bring it in with a forklift. Uh, that's an ISO 9 clean room. We then have on the next way going anti-clockwise, we've got clean room one. Um, that is a class eight clean room. It can also be run at ISO six as well, uh, if the customers require it. Um, we do a simple dress code change and it has its own changing room available. Um, it's not immediately obvious here, but there is it's a dedicated entrance from the ISO 8 area here, which allows you to change your garment um, style and use this as ISO 6. Uh, there's then the electromagnetics facility, which is again ISO 8. There's the main hall, which links everything together. Uh, that again is ISO 8. Dynamics facility, ISO 8 again. Clean room two and its dedicated storeroom, uh, ISO 8. 
And then we have a, another ISO 8 clean room, which is used for the preparation of items to go into the vacuum chamber um, and then associated with the vacuum chamber. But at low level, um, we have an EGSC space dedicated for that chamber. So most of you, or some of you anyway, will know this bit already, but this is, let's take this as an ISO clean room. Um, it's a box in a box. Um, everything we put into the room or need to use to operate the room generates heat. In our case, we've allowed for 50 kilowatt heat load from the satellite, plus all of the additional equipment that we need to move the air around and condition it. So we put fresh air in at the top of the room. Um, we filter that, so we remove the majority of the contaminants from it. We then push that conditioned air into the clean room space itself using multiple filters, uh, what's known as HEPA filters. Um, each of those has its own unique fan that pushes that air in, so we have a lot of resilience in the filtration there. The satellite itself and all the equipment adds heat into the room. We take that heated air back through grills in the wall at very low level. Um, we return that air back up through hollow walls or ductwork. Um, we then pass it through cooling coils um, to bring it back to the temperature we need to offset the heat in the room and then keep repeating. And we do repeat a lot. So we recirculate the air volume in the clean rooms roughly once per four minutes. Um, that means for the, if you look at the building as a whole, we have about 200 HEPA filters in the building and we are circulating about 400,000 cubic meters of air every hour through those filters. That's a lot of air. It's a quite a challenging task. Um, clean room tub one, as I mentioned earlier, can also be run ISO 6, uh, and we just increase the air change rate through the filters to um, give more efficient uh, removal of particulate in the air. And it's probably worth noting as well that we supply all of the consumables all of the garments and the laundry service that you need when you come to access the clean rooms. And this is what actually looks like in reality. Um, so you should be able to see what I've been talking about. You have grills at low level to return the air. We have supply points in the ceiling to supply the air. In fact, these are shown without the filters fitted. This is an early stage photo as you can see from people not in clean room dress. So air in at the top, warm air out at the bottom. It's quite a simple design. So I noted that we actually generate a lot of heat and our customers generate a lot of heat. And in fact, our tester facilities themselves need a lot of cooling. Um, so we use water to do that. It's, a, it's an efficient way of moving heat around. So, we need about one and a half megawatts of cooling, believe it or not. It's a lot of cooling. Um, but we put twice that in because if one chiller fails, we need one there as a backup. It's so important to us. Um, we need to move that water around. Um, so we have a distribution system, effectively um, a, a large diameter set of pipes around the building. And we move the water around to and from that using pumps. Um, where we have one pump, we have two in a one standby pair. So we can allow for maintenance or failures of those pumps. Um, we take the air conditioning for both the clean rooms and the office spaces and some of the facility spaces um, from that distribution circuit, again, through primary and redundant pumps or run and standby systems. We also then take water off for the thermal vacuum test facility. That actually needs quite a lot of chilled water. But to make sure we, um, if a, a leak in a different circuit could affect it, we actually bring it through a heat exchanger to separate, physically separate the water from one system to the other. So we end up with a little bit of extra resilience in the system by doing that. We do exactly the same for the vibration facility where the power amplifiers and other systems need water cooling. And again, for the customer loads. So we provide chilled water um, loops for the customer to use at the electromagnetics facility. 
and at the TVAC facility. Um, so we have the option for customers to call their equipment or RF loads or whatever is needed um, local to those facilities. So um, we talked about chill water, but to generate the chill water, we need electricity. Um, so we're quite lucky really here on the STFC Harwell campus uh, that we've actually got good links to the UK national grid. Um, so all the high voltage, 132 kV and 11 kV systems uh, that feed both the campus and ourselves are redundant. So we have, well, we need one transformer, we have two. It allows us to maintain or for failure and it's not to have a major problem. Um, we have 11 kV to 400 volt transformers local to the building, which are brand new. And then the NSTF itself takes three different classifications of power, or we call them three types of power. So you have general power for, for regular stuff, um, things you don't mind if they disappear or they get powered down. You have essential equipment that needs to run but can survive a short power outage. And then you have critical equipment. That's the stuff you need to keep running. Um, it allows you to either understand how badly things have gone wrong if you lose power or to keep things running so they don't get damaged. So in the event of a power failure, immediately everything on the critical equipment is taken over from uh, by a UPS system. So we can supply 615 kilowatts um, on batteries for 15 minutes. Um, that includes all of our safety systems, is an allocation for each of our customers for their equipment, and it keeps various key parts of the building, such as the TVAC facility, running at a basic level. Um, this UPS system is also fault tolerant, so um, we can actually lose one third of the system itself and still support 600 kilowatts of load. But within the next two minutes, the diesel generator takes over that we have, uh, and that takes the loads for all of the essential equipment. Um, that includes the rest of the TVAC chamber, so it's fully autonomous on the generator. And it also accounts for a reduced air conditioning capacity throughout the clean rooms. Now, we can't do everything, um, so we, we move a little less air around, and we have a little less available cooling. But the, the, the still the basic functionality of the building is preserved. And at the same time, of course, we recharge the UPS. Uh, we hold about um, 24 hours worth of diesel on a full load. That gives us enough time to make the decision of, is this a significant issue that we're not going to see the power come back from? Or do we need to um, perform a safe shutdown? Or is it not feasible to perform a safe shutdown and we need to start bringing in additional diesel um, for future run? And generator-wise, um, this picture is, doesn't really do the generator justice. Um, so it's 16 cylinder, 65 litre diesel generator. Um, this is actually a picture just as we were performing the site load tests. Uh, the image bottom right, um, you can just see a number here, 1,790 kilowatts. Um, so that was our load test. We ran for a couple of hours on that load on site just to make sure it was fully functional. Um, I can assure you, it's noisy. It uses a lot of air, um, not just for its cooling, which is drawn through the radiator here, but actually ingests a lot of air through it itself for combustion. Um, so another sort of important part of the big sort of infrastructure items is earthing. So the NSTF has two user earth systems. Uh, protective Earth and Reference Earth. Protective Earth, that, that's just standard mains Earth. That's the thing that everybody has in the house, in their office. It's the thing that's there for electrical safety. And then we have a Reference Earth. That Reference Earth is, um, in our case, about a 500 square metres um, copper grid buried underground. And it's connected into the building itself uh, using some high cross-sectional area cables, uh, about 70 millimetres squared. Um, it's a big grid. 
Um, it's actually buried under our rainwater attenuation system. Um, so it can't be easily disturbed by other works. And there's a road on top of it, again, which helps protect it. Both of these earth systems are available in the clean rooms. Um, but we do have to be a little careful about what we connect and how. Um, so before we can allow people to connect to the reference earth and the, protect the protective earth at the same time, or one or the other, we just need to understand the safety and risks behind it. And that's the reality of our reference earth. So this is when they were digging for the grid. In fact, you can see the grid. It's just the shiny lines. Um, just where my cursor is, you can just see the hint of that. To scale it, that's some a, um, a metal step system to get into the pit. It's a big grid. So I've talked a little about our need for air into the clean rooms, chill water, electricity. It's hard to kind of scale these systems a little bit. So this is the NSTF building, it's a slightly different shot, uh, taken around November last year. Um, this is where we put the air into the building um, to scale that. This space is in the order of 20 meters side to side. So it is quite a big chunk, 20 by 20 roughly that space. Um, this is the chillers I was talking about, the two 1.5 megawatt chillers. Um, they're about 15 meters long. So again, big items. And our diesel generator. You can kind of get a scale for that from the car parking spaces just to the side of it. Um, so if you can imagine, that is what, five spaces long, four or five spaces long, gives you an idea of the scale. It's big stuff for quite a large building. So talked about the big things. Now we ought to talk about the smaller things, the sort of user interaction, the bits that the customers see. Um, so all of our spaces have um, what's known as small power, so 13 amp UK sockets distributed around the outside. Um, it's an easy way of connecting low power stuff. But we also recognize that there is a need for higher power things and other services. So we have a standardized system that we deploy around the clean rooms. Um, this, cover, this includes our monitoring systems, our power distribution for high power, includes our earth references, so both protective and reference earth behind some doors, and it includes the distribution of gases. I will cover various ones of these elements later. This is where the standardized service panels are. So you're never far from one of these panels to, for a high power connection. And there are multiples of these panels in each room or each area. So I've already talked about power and earth a little bit. So let's talk about the monitoring side. So um, it's really important that we and our customers in, understand both the real time um, environmental conditions in the facility and the historical performance of the facility to, to give confidence we can deliver what we need to do. So we have a real-time um, monitoring system known as the our Environmental Monitoring System or EMS. Um, we already use this in multiple buildings, so our two existing buildings have this installed and our new system is an extension to that. So the NSTF has 21 new particle counters deployed within it. Um, they continuously sample the air um, at 0.1 of a cubic feet per minute in four particle sizes. But I guess it allows you to understand whether the filtration and basic performance of the room is up to standard and allows you to um, figure out whether you have a, a from with the building or whether you're seeing a, a degradation of the system over time. We have 17 different locations where we monitor temperature, humidity, and pressure. Again, to just make sure we're meeting the customer requirements and that we can look to make sure the control systems are working correctly. We have in-room displays of real-time and historical data. So the panel here is from one of our existing buildings. 
Um, this allows you to see the current pressure, temperature and humidity in your room. Um, also lets you assess whether you're within the ISO class of the room for cleanliness. And it allows you to look at the, some um, graphical trends of that data as well. Um, it gives you a quick glance if you're doing something to be able to go, we're in spec or this is what my current temperature is and record it in your logs. We can also provide that data electronically through data exports or CSV files if that's needed. We also have an alarm system in the rooms. Um, so that tells you if any of the parameters have gone out of specification, so temperature, humidity, or cleanliness. And as I said, it's part of our main system, our main acquisition system. So we store all this data um, centrally and we can analyze it and provide printouts or reports to our customers as well. So that's real time. Now, if we look a little bit more about historical or integrated contamination, um, we deploy um, particle fallout and molecular monitoring in all of the areas. And we have 30 combined positions in the building. We use an industry standard PFO plate. Um, in this, for us, it's the ESA plates. Um, and we use their standardized equipment, which is the Ingenious Systems PFO meter. And we use our own in-house um, molecular monitoring witnesses and FTIR process. But we can also provide this for our customers. Um, so we can provide portable particle counters, which we can place near customer hardware. That allows the, the real-time environment right next to the process to be understood. We can provide PFO plates um, to place around equipment. And we can also provide our own um, molecular samples and analyze those in-house as well. That offers a quick turnaround of contamination analysis. So one of the other things that was noted on the service panel was gases. So we use compressed air in the facilities. We use quite a lot of it. Uh, we use it for the TVAC facility. We use it for the vibration facility. But equally, our customers may need to use it as well. So they might need to use it for general valves or equipment, but more likely they, they might want to use it for air skates um, to move heavy items around. So what we've done is specified this system to be able to cope with that sort of load. So we've got air compressors. We've got a big air compressor. Um, I couldn't find an easily accessible image of this um, because it's a big thing in quite a small room. Um, think of this air compressor of the size of an old Fiat 500 or a classic Mini. It's quite large, 75 kilowatts of electrical power. That allows us to deliver about 120 litres a second of air at seven bar, which is typically what we want to use for air skates. We put it into a big reservoir, so we store some, which gives us some efficiency on how many times the air compressor cycles. We course filter it at one micron. We filter it again at 0.1 micron. We put it through a dryer to bring the dew point of the air down to about minus 70 to minus 90 C. We filter it again. We filter it again, this time through carbon, or activated carbon. Uh, this removes any molecular content. We then filter it again in case we've picked up any of the carbon filtration dust. Um, this time again at 0.1 microns. And then we store it. We store another big bulk load of it, again, to, to just help take some of the demand surges out of the system. And then we deliver it to the user. And the user might be our customers, or it might be us as facilities. But alongside the theme we've tried to play in the rest of the building, if we've got one, we probably need two, because we need to maintain it. We need to take an air compressor offline for servicing it. We need to change the filters and hopefully not, but at some point things will need replacing or they may fail. So we have a, a, a run and standby system there. So because it's so important to us, that's what we have. So again, on the user interface front, I showed this slide last time and it's pretty much unchanged. So this shows um, some of our cranes. 
Um, typically, our crane hook heights are at 13 meters within the, the main clean rooms. Um, the difference is the electromagnetics crane is slightly lower. Um, and the odd thing to note, maybe slightly, that the crane in the TVAC facility actually bridges across and ends up in clean room two. Um, just economy of scale and the configuration of the runways of the cranes just made that easier. Um, the cranes can be used by anybody. Um, a person needs to obviously be trained and we will give them local familiarization with the cranes to make sure that they are, um, we've understood their competence and that they're fully prepared to use it. Um, and we will be expecting our customers to actually operate the cranes rather than ourselves for the majority of their hardware lifts. So a little bit more about the detail of cranes. So that's one of our crane hooks. Um, you can just about see a stainless steel hook for the crane. And there's a capture plate here, which is again stainless steel. And this is during our uh, acceptance of the cranes. This is where we're measuring the performance of the cranes for their speed. Um, so all of these cranes have been customized. Um, the runways, so the rails they run on, and the wheels are stainless steel. Um, we've put many other stainless steel items in place, and we've had the speed suggested to what we believe is um, what people need. So they move quite slowly, or at least on their slow speed they do. So the minimum hoist speed is 100 millimeters a minute, or, or, or in old numbers, uh, four inches per minute. Um, as I noted, they're stainless steel wheels and runways, so we don't actually disturb paint or rust or any other contaminants that might be generated by the movement um, to become airborne and contaminate the room. They do straight lifting, so um, they're a twin drum crane, which means when you lift, they always go straight up and straight down. Old, older cranes might actually translate the hook as you lift. So if you need to lift, remove part of an item and then put it down, you're still doing a straight lift. It's quite an advantage for some movements. Um, we have the catchers under the hook or under the, the lubricated items, um, which we can extend to suit different programs. And they're either radio controlled or pendant controlled. So for some programs, and the majority of programs, in fact, will be happy with a radio control. Um, these allow access to all the functions of the crane. But if there's a concern about security or interference or any other, thing, other things going on, then we can swap to a hardwired pendant control, uh, which means that we're less susceptible to any, any issues. And roughly in the time I've taken to explain that, the crane will have moved to the so about 100 millimeters. So another one of our prime user interfaces is electronic communications. So movement of digital information, both within the facilities and in general nowadays is critical. So we think we thought about this in the design. So we've put high speed fiber links between each of the individual facilities and each of our customer office spaces um, as standard. So you can see that a facility, in this case, um, an EGSC room associated with the electromagnetics facility has its own fiber to customer office one and its own fiber to customer office two. Um, so a customer can connect equipment here and have further equipment here and has a dedicated high-speed data link. And that's the same for all of these. And they're just built into the facility as standard. But you may need to get data outwards as well. Um, so what we have is our links that we just talked about from one facility into the customer office, and we provide a patch panel in there. Uh, our customers will then bring their own active switching equipment, which maybe they're looking to distribute their office network, their telephones, their printers, and they'll connect back to their base through their own VPN or cryptology system, linked via um, fiber back to our firewall, out to the internet, 
and then back to their own premises. Um, we can provide address addressable routes from um, through our firewall to allow our customers to connect to their um, own internal networks through our systems and back out through the internet. And actually being a large research-based organization that deal with high data throughputs all the time, we're quite well, um, well blessed with data links. So we, we, we have good speed. And of course, what everybody wants to know, we have free Wi-Fi. Um, so we actually deploy three networks, a standard that people can access, uh, government Wi-Fi, which is a, a free government service, Edurome, which is um, deployed across a number of educational establishments um, around the UK and some parts of Europe. And we have our own guest network if people aren't members of those other two. So looking a little bit at security and privacy now. Um, so all of the customer offices, meeting rooms and clean rooms are all access controlled. Well, I didn't know in there in one direction. So we don't swipe in and out. We swipe in and then you request to come out by pushing a button. Um, that just means we can't do a roll call of who's in the area, but we can still limit who can go into the area. Not limitation either by person or by group or team or by time or a combination of those. Uh, so we could say, uh, Team member one in customer B goes in only between nine o'clock in the morning and 10 o'clock in the morning. So we, we, we have a, a number of ways we can restrict access. Um, and all of those access attempt, attempts, either successful or unsuccessful, are logged on our system. And that is part of our main STFC access control system. It's not a, it's not a simple um, simple system that's just unique to NSTF. It's a big enterprise-sized system that is a part of STFC. We have a CCTV system installed within the building and in fact, outside the building as well. So I took a, a brief set of screenshots this morning just to show some typical imagery. Um, so top left, we have the dynamics facility. We have our clean room one. It looks a bit black and white, but it's just because the lights were off in there. We have some of the external space. So this is our, our sort of parkway that walks into it where we've got some seating and some casual spaces to just have a break. And then this is the main entrance foyer associated with it. Um, we do not have cameras within the office spaces for privacy reason. And this system is not available to everybody to actually view. Um, it's a private secure system that can't be accessed by staff in general. Um, if there is a need for secure programs, we can physically disable cameras and cover them and deal with issues that way, if there's a, a particular restriction to what can be recorded or not. And for privacy, um, we have windows that view from both, both of our floors of customer offices. So we have offices on the first floor and on the second floor, and they have windows to allow you to view the clean rooms. But not always do we want people to be able to do that. So we have blinds on the windows. Uh, those blinds are controllable from within the clean rooms. So our customers in the clean rooms can control when people can see now or not. Um, it's worth noting that not all of the clean room spaces are fully private. We have things like the main hall and the TVAC preparation clean room, which are shared spaces that people will walk through or can view. Um, and any privacy issues around that we have to deal with on a contract by contract basis. Um, move on towards safety systems. So um, we have a fire alarm system, as you'd expect. Um, it's specific to the NSTF and it's been designed to meet our needs, but it's linked to the main STFC system. Um, its detection sort of technology um, depends on the area. Um, and some kinds, sometimes multiple detection types are used. But our types are aspirating, where we're, we're continuously sampling a, an amount of the air out of the rooms and looking for smoke, smoke particles. We do heat detection and we do traditional smoke detection. 
the latter two more being in office and sort of plant spaces where you might expect more dust and the aspirating system would be false triggered more often. Um, we do not have a built-in fire suppression system in the bulk of the building, um, but we do have fire extinguishers for use for extinguishing. Um, we have an on-site instant response team. So as soon as alarm on a fire system is received, we have a 24-7 a team who will come and investigate and sort of triage the incident and decide whether it's a, a false alarm, uh, a real alarm or a false alarm, uh, and then uh, coordinate local services or emergency response teams as needed on site. They have the best local knowledge of the building and can make a judgment on what's going on. But they're also supported by the, um, the NSTF team who are on call 24 seven as well. I have access to both remote telemetry of the building and um, voice communications with them, with the um, investigation team. And we also have an oxygen monitoring system in the building. So we use quite a, little, quite a lot of liquid nitrogen in the building and that turns into gaseous nitrogen. And we use gaseous nitrogen for various different things as well. So leaks of any of these would deplete the oxygen levels in the air, um, which is a significant risk to life. Um, so all of the clean rooms and some of the other spaces are fitted with, the oxygen, with an oxygen monitoring system and with local alarms both in the building and outside the building and warning beacons just to make sure people are aware um, and there's obviously full risk assessments between uh, around any of the activities we perform within those areas. So I've talked about the big stuff. I've talked about our interfaces to the customers. But, but how do we know we can actually do this? Um, how do we know we can the, the design we've come up with works um, uh, and we can deliver it. And the simple answer is really because we've done it before. Um, so this is one of the NSTF clean rooms. This is our clean room one. Um, not quite in its finished state, but almost. Um, it's a little bit more advanced than this now. And this is one of our ISO 5 clean rooms in the R100 building, which is just adjacent to the NSTF. Um, we've been operating clean rooms such as the one in R100 for multiple years, um, some of them for up to several decades. Um, the R100 building was, was opened in 2015. Um, so we actually operate about 3,000 square metres of clean rooms at the present time. Um, the NSTF will nearly double that, but they all are roughly the same. So let's, let's have a look at that. So we have um, a monitoring system um, and standardised services throughout the room. Um, you can see standard services here and here. And in fact, if you take these services, you can see them at another location in the room. Um, slightly reduced set of services, but the same basic stuff. We have overhead cranes, um, slightly different in the amount they can lift, but same basic idea. We have ESD flooring, um, different color, same principle, epoxy ESD flooring. We have people. So we're used to dealing with the logistics of getting people in and out of rooms. We're used to providing gowning, um, either full suits as shown in the R100 image or um, a more of a lab coat style that we would typically require in the NSTF. Plus all the consumables and laundry and everything that goes around that. We have a good managed supply chain for that. Both rooms use distributive filtration. So we bring cooled air in at the top through multiple filters. And we let escape back out through grills in the walls and return back up to the top. Um, exactly the same in both things. So really, the only thing that's a difference is the height of the rooms and the size of the doors that you need to get into the rooms. We are used to doing this. We're used to delivering these. Um, and I thought I'd finish off with one last image. So Matt mentioned we'll be taking some representative hardware through the facilities so we can characterize them and to actually sort of get to grips with how to handle these. As I said, our existing rooms are smaller. 
these rooms are much bigger in height and the size of the test items are much larger as well. So this is our first test item or first um, characterization item, a satellite arriving just a couple of weeks ago. Um, gives you an idea of the scale of the building and the entrance there. And that's me done. Thank you, Giles. So that was a completely comprehensive overview of what the building has to offer. Um, and I am just going to give you a very quick introduction to what the wider campus has to support you whilst you're on the, the location. So slightly different view of the campus from some you've already seen. Um, the NSTF is actually located behind the, e, the second E in welcome in this shot. Um, but as a whole, you can see that it's, it's a big campus. There's a lot of different things going on. And we have around three billion pounds worth of national infrastructure on the campus, um, hosting around 16 national facilities, covering a wide range of different things um, from life sciences through to uh, healthcare and um, energy re research, as well as a, a wide number of uh, space companies. And in total, we've got over 200 companies on campus. Um, and the site itself is around 710 acres. Um, so it, it's able to encompass uh, a wide range of green spaces, as well as the buildings that you've seen. You saw from the picture that Matt showed earlier where we are in the UK. Um, just to put that into context a little bit, uh, we're not far from Didcot uh, with the mainline rail station there. And we're about 45 minutes from London Heathrow um, with uh, both rail and road links uh, available that way. Um, in addition to the Rutherford Appleton Lab capabilities that we've talked about, we also host the, uh, the European Space Agency EXAT facility, which has got a range of, of capabilities on site. Um, and they're actually currently in the process of building a new event centre on site that is due to open later this year uh, that will then further complement the other capabilities that, that we and the campus have been putting in place. So in terms of what, what availability there is on site to work, um, the, in addition to the office spaces uh, that Giles has mentioned within NSTF that are linked to the campaigns, there's a range of office space options on campus if that is helpful to be able to support your work um, along with other meeting rooms. Importantly, there are various catering options. Um, so there's a whole variety of different things on site um, and distributed around. Um, and we also have a, a gym and we have a, a post office on site as well. So it's, it's well served. Um, to be able to, to keep going with everyday life around the work that's required. Uh, we are an operational site for science. Um, so we do have on-site accommodation in the form of Ridgeway House. Um, but also, as, as mentioned from that map, uh, we're not far from either Didcot or Oxford, um, which have a, a whole range of different accommodation options. That's all very well and good though, but you still need to know where to look. Um, and we have a, a user office on site who supports our scientists. Um, so we have visitors from around the world uh, for short term visits for um, a couple of weeks through to um, multi year uh, instrument development campaigns. So they are able to help you find appropriate accommodation for what you need uh, for a duration that makes sense. Um, and they've got all sorts of insights into the local area and, and where might be a good fit for your team. So that's a very quick whistle stop tour through the wider campus and what's available. Um, and to close, I will pass you over to Richard Smith, the group leader for the Manufacturing Facilities Group, STFC. Now he's kindly recorded a short video to tell you a little bit about the manufacturing solutions available on site that would also be available to you. 
Richard Smith, and I'm the group leader of the Manufacturing Facilities Group that sits within technology here at STFC at RAL. Um, the purpose of the group is to provide all the manufacturing solutions to support the science and research that's conducted here at RAL. Within the group, we consist of mainly four facilities. We have um, the workshops, which consist of a machine shop, which uh, has conventional machines all the way through to five axis uh, machining capability, laser etching and wire EDM. We also have a sheet metal workshop that uh, can do fabricated sheet components as well. To support the, the, those facilities, we have a dimensional metrology uh, department where all the components are inspected on completion. It has the capability to inspect down to five microns with a variety of contact and visual CMM machines. There are various other pieces of equipment in there that um, support all inspection requirements. Alongside that, we have, have an additive manufacture facility that 3D prints components mainly in polymers. And then to support all those internal facilities, we have um, an outside manufacturing procurement office. The purpose of this group is to be able to procure within a contracted supply base of suppliers um, items that are either not suitable for manufacture internally or we cannot make through capacity. So that is pretty much what the manufacturing facility group consists of. Um, it's not a facility that is directly linked with a national satellite testing facility, but it is a facility that will be able to offer support to customers if required using that facility. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Um, so hopefully that gives you a flavor of what's available um, on campus. Um, we have got a couple of questions, Giles, if you're available to do a quick q and a. It's a very quick wrap up. Um, so the, the first question, um, what happens when people arrive? So everyone, someone, the, the team are booked in, um, the test campaign team turn up. What, what happens then? What do they do? So there will be a, a whole series of things that happens way before that. Um, and the key things are to understand people's security requirements for access and to get a pre-authorised list of people that can come in and to understand who gives the permission for that. Um, a lot of the time we will have done the hard work beforehand. We will have um, done a lot of the paperwork exercise of understanding who people are and getting proof of ID. Uh, but as people arrive, um, there'll be a health and safety briefing plus um, a short period where we need to take people's photos and, and get them issued site passes. Um, that will be coordinated through our user office, um, which is situated at our main gate, not far away from the NSTF. Um, um, then the people will uh, collect their passes, which is quite a quick process, and then be introduced into the NSTF itself through a local induction process. So that actually leads on to my, my next question, which is in terms, you've talked about access to the facility and swipe card access and how that's all controlled. Um, and you've also talked about the responsibilities that the customer has for, for their equipment. What happens in terms of 24 hour working? If a team need to be able to be in the, in the facility overnight, are they able to be in there unsupervised? What, what are the, what's the approach? Good question. Good question. Um, various different people do do it different ways. So we are a 24 seven facility when we need to be. So if we're running a test campaign, for example, on thermal vacuum testing, or you need staff there to operate the facilities, we will be there. Um, if it's a, if like a, a non test time where a customer is just using the clean room, then we have no objections to the customer being there overnight on their own. Um, there's a few, relatively simple health and safety precautions to take around loan working, um, a few risk assessments in place, and we have a loan working alarm system which we can deploy, um, which would um, which would uh, alert our security team if there is an issue. And of course, we have an on-site security team and instant investigation team who are there to support as well. Thank you. 
Well, I think that's us just about out of time. Um, so thank you for that comprehensive overview, Giles. I hope everyone else has found it as informative as I have for the level of complexity that is being encompassed within the building. And for me personally, when I walk around the building, it, it's, it's completely invisible and seamless, all of that complexity behind the walls, which is a huge achievement. Um, so we, as we've said before, we're looking forward to, to welcoming people into the facility and opening the doors. And you've seen Matt's timeline in terms of the aim for, for the, the current schedule, looking to be doing that in the second half of next year. Um, we do have a regular newsletter that is sent out um, in the alternating months with these webinars. So please do sign up for that. And if you have any specific inquiries, please do get in touch and I will get back to you and con connect you with the team to take that forward. So thank you for listening and we look forward to seeing you again next time.